Hello, this is uh, BPSC 031 Spring Wildflowers. This is lecture one of week six, corresponding to Monday, May the 4th. We passed halfway of a course, so we should celebrate. We're getting there. Uh, I was, I have to confess, I was very concerned about online and remote uh, teaching, I still am, but um, we are gradually making progress. Uh, this, this week, we are going to see two very, very important plant families, the rose family, the rosaceae, and the oak family, the phagaceae. Uh, for different reasons, both are extremely important as uh, we will see the rose family, the family rosaceae, apart from giving us some really pretty flowers that we seem, human beings seem to be uh, very uh, fond of, uh, they provide us with an incredible amount and diversity of fruits. Uh, from the rose family, we get, uh, <clears throat> just out of the top of my mind, we, we get um, strawberries, we get uh, raspberries, we get blackberries, uh, we get um, all the stone fruits. We get uh, um, peaches, apricots, um, plums, uh, mm, cherries, um, even almonds, believe it or not, belong uh, to this uh, family. And then from the palm fruit uh, subfamily, we get apples, uh, crab apples, uh, quince, pears, uh, loquats, and uh, a number of uh, other um, important fruit plants. So it's an important family in terms of uh, feeding the human population because they, this is where, from where we get most of our fruits. Uh, the oak family is a completely different story. Oaks basically, the only fruit they produce is acorns. Um, the California uh, First Nations, the original people from California, like the Kumeyaay, for example, here in Southern California, used to eat the acorns of, uh, of the oaks. But uh, really, the acorns uh, to this day are not a major source of food for human beings. They contain a huge amount of tannin and we have a difficulty um, uh, digesting tannin. Um, the, the native Californians used to wash the, the acorn, uh, the ground acorn flower quite a bit to get uh, rid of the tannin. So the oaks have not made it into an important family for uh, food sources, although from other members of the oak family, like for example, from the chestnuts, we get some very important nuts that we consume in large amounts, especially in winter. But the most important aspect of the oak family, and especially the oaks, is the production of wood. Uh, oaks produce a wonderfully tough wood uh, that used to be strategic in, in uh, Europe dur during the time of the tall ships. Uh, the masts were made of pine, but the um, part in the hull that went underwater that you needed to be very, very tough uh, uh, was made of oak. Oak is also made to this day to make uh, oak barrels and oak casks that are used to age everything from whiskey to wine. And uh, oaks also to this day, um, one oak species in particular Caracus super produces um, cork. Uh, cork is, uh, to this day, all the cork that is consumed, especially in the wine industry and in, in other um, industries of fermented beverages, uh, is all produced uh, from oak. So oaks have really have evolved with human beings that have been strategically incredibly important and uh, they, they actually still to this day have a high importance in a number of things that we'll discuss when we see the family. So 
let me share the screen and show you. Uh, let us start with the Rose family. We will see uh, today, Monday, the, the 4th, the Rose family. On Wednesday, the 6th, we will continue seeing the Rose family. And in Friday, we will see the Oaks. So I'll share the screen, the screen and uh, we'll start with the Oak family. Sorry, with the Rose family. Uh, one of the most important traits, uh, uh, sorry, I'll go back before that. Uh, the Rose family is a very diverse family. You will find some very, very small plants uh, with stolons that creep in the forest floor to some fairly big shrubs and trees, uh, like, for example, the peach or the pear tree or, or the um, um, apple tree that can be quite large if you, if you allow them to grow without pruning them. So, and the leaves can be compound. They might have compound leaves with, uh, with um, folios or they might have simple leaves. Uh, so there is, as opposed to other families that seem to have a more uniform um, appearance, the, the, the rose family has a very heterogeneous appearance, but it does have one thing that makes it very, very distinct, and that is the flower. <clears throat> All the plants in the rose family have similar flowers. Uh, perhaps, curiously enough, the plant that has a species that has the most dissimilar flowers is uh, the rose itself, because it's been selected by gardeners for large, for hugely large flowers with many, many petals. But in the wild, all plants in the rose family have five petals, as you can see in this image, one, two, three, four, five. They have a large number of stamens um, that can vary from species to species, but they're counted in, in tens or dozens. Um, uh, they can have a multitude of stamens, some, some species. So stamens are not, the only distinctive trait of the stamens is that they have a huge number. And it might have one pistil, as in this image here, or a multitude of pistils, many pistils. Uh, so what is it that makes uh, the plants in the rose family so distinctive? It is this cup-shaped structure that you see here in this cut uh, that is typical of a rose family. This is known as a hypantium. And uh, it's basically an elongation, an enlargement of the calyx that uh, makes the floral parts sort of be surrounding the flower above the calyx. And in some cases it actually, it's so adhered or so, so joined, so fused to the calyx that the calyx is in fear, that the ovary, sorry, so fused to the, to the ovary that the ovary is inferior. Uh, in this case, the ovary is superior because it's separated from the flower parts, but it has uh, a, a large uh, hypantium, or as we learned in, in morphology, the flower is periginous. The, the, the rest of the flower parts, the uh, sepals, the petals and the stamens seem to be surrounding the calyx a little bit above the calyx, but not adhere, not fused to it. Uh, there are, according to the fruit, uh, there are four subfamilies in the family Rosaceae. And uh, I mentioned this with some trepidation because uh, the family has been reclassified with molecular morph biology using DNA. And the classification is way more complex than it used to be just a few years ago. But the, the old classification is so intuitively simple for an introductory course like this one, that I'll stick to the, to the old classification of the rose family. There are some plants in the rose family, including the roses themselves, that have a very enlarged hypantium, hypantium with a multitude of, of uh, pistils inside. You can see here the style and the stigma barely coming out. And of course, with a multitude of uh, stamens um, coming out from the hypantium, from the edge of the hypantium 
itself. Uh, this family, the fruits that this family produce, they all have uh, enlarged uh, hypantia, and, uh, and the fruit is normally an aggregate of pistils because they have many pistils. Um, and it includes the strawberry, and when we reach to the subfamily, we'll discuss it. The rose itself, rose hips, are in this group. And of course, the raspberries and blackberries also are in this group. We'll discuss them later. Uh, this, the plants with this flower morphology are known as the rosoidae. Within the family rosaceae, the subfamily rosoidae. There is another family that if you look at the flower, it looks very similar. It has a hypantium, a very large hypantium. It has one pistil uh, with an ovary, a style, and a stigma. And the ovary has only one seed. Uh, this type of flower, when it gets fertilized, the fruit it will give is a droop, like peaches, for example, or apricots or cherries. So the one seeded with a placentation here is basil. It's got only one seed, and the one seeded fruit will develop into a droop. The three layers within the ovary will become the exocarp, will become the, the skin of a fruit. The mesocarp will develop into a fleshy structure. It will be the reward for the fruit dispersers. Uh, and the endocarp will become bony, uh, rich in, in, in lignin and cellulose, really hard. And it will become a structure that protects the seed. This second family, in honor of the genus Prunus, which is the Latin for plum and cherry, uh, this second family is known as the Prunoidae. Then there's a third family that you can see down here, in which it still has a hypantium. It has an ovary. The ovary normally is mediceded with uh, axile placentation. They're attached by the placenta at the center. It's formed by normally five fused carpels. It can be more or less, but normally five fused carpels with axial placentation and many seeds, uh, not, not one like in the Prunoidae, not uh, also in the, in the Rosoidae, each um, pistil has only one seed. Here it has only one pistil, but it has multiple seeds inside the pistil, and the pistil is formed by the fusion of uh, five carpels. Another trait that it makes this family very distinguishable is that the style and the stigmas that come out of the, of the pistil, of the fused carpal, are many, as many as carpals are fused in the pistil. So we'll see <clears throat> normally it has, uh, if you cut the fruit, it has um, five loci. Uh, it's formed by the fusion of five carpals, and you will see uh, here appearing up here, one, two, three, four, five styles. And the other trait in this family is that the hypantium is fused with the pistil. It's completely fused with the pistil. And so when the ovary becomes fertilized, instead of the hypantium wilting and drying off, it will start growing into a fleshy structure together with the pistil. And the resulting fruit is a pome, like an apple. It will have the, the pedicel of the fruit below, and it will have the floral parts, like we see in apples, on top of the apple. And the flesh of the fruit is not formed by the growth of the ovary alone, but it's formed by the growth of the ovary and the hypantium. They both provide the flesh for the fruit. And this family, by the way, is known as maloidae. Also, some botanists used to describe it as pomoidae or maloidae. And then finally, there is one last family that doesn't give fleshy fruits. It doesn't contribute to the uh, legendary richness of fruits in the, um, in the family Rosaceae, but yields dry fruits. All the way from some flowers have only one pistil, like in the mountain mahogany that grows all around the mountains 
in Southern California, to plants with many pistils. But the main trait in, in this family is that the fruits are dry. They normally form a follicle, a dry capsule. You can see it here. Uh, the base of the fruit evolves into a dry capsule and uh, with the seed inside. And these are known as the spiroidae, uh, following the name of the genus Spirea, which is one of the leading genera in this family. So let me recap the, um, the main families, the main subfamilies of the family Rosaceae. A, multiple pistils, enlarged hypantium. It's the subfamily Rosoidae that includes uh, rose hips, uh, strawberries, and raspberries. B, only uh, one pistil with only one ovule developing into a droop with a bony endocarp. This is a family prunoidae uh, that includes things like peaches, apricots, cherries, um, and plums, among many others. Uh, a hypantium, a, a multicarpal ovary with many seeds, and a hypantium that is perfectly fused with the ovary. Uh, so the ovary is actually truly inferior and uh, develops into a large fleshy fruit that is uh, um, a result of the uh, joining of the hypantium and, and the ovary. Uh, this is a family uh, maloidi, the subfamily maloidi, the apple subfamily. So let us call it the rose subfamily, the cherry subfamily, the apple subfamily. And this one was when the fruit is dry and it's normally a dry follicle. Uh, very often the style of the fruit, the stigma is plumose. The style of the fruit doesn't fall after fertilization, but creates like a feathery structure that eventually when the seed is released, allows the, the seed to fly in the air. This is the family Spiroidae. So let us, oh, here we have um, the, the four subfamilies. And let us move now to uh, the differences between subfamilies. The Rosoidae in the leaves normally have stipules. The Spiroidae never have stipules. The number of carpels in the Rosoidae is a large number of carpels. They're separated. They are uh, apocarpus, uh, so it has a large number of pistils. The fruit is a small drooper and a keen, but supported by a large, ag aggregated in a large or enlarged hypantium. The flower insertion is perigenous. That is, the, the flower parts are around a superior ovary. The spiroidy has no stipules. The number of carpels is two to five, in some cases one, even 12. The fruit is a dry fruit, it's a follicle, and that is a subfamily spiroidae. The subfamily prunoidae uh, has stipules in the leaves. It has only one carpel, uh, forming only one um, pistil, and the fruit is a drupe. And then finally, the apple subfamily, the subfamily homoidae or maloidae. Uh, it has uh, two to five carpels, and the apple normally is five. Then the fruit is a pome, and the ovary is an inferior ovary. You have there a taxonomic key that is also present in your lecture notes to identify. No other family, no other botanical family gives as many fruits as the rose family does. You can see here raspberries, you can see here a rose hip, you can see a pear, an apple, a plum, another plum, uh, an apple, etc, etc. It's If you go to the market, you will see that more than half of the fruits that are normally sold in the market belong to the rose so family, to the rose uh, family. Now, let's see some photographs of the subfamilies within the roses. The subfamily Rosoidae, if you cut a rose, and we'll do that, we'll do some dissections next uh, class on Wednesday. If you cut a rose, what you will see 
is a very, very enlarged hepantium, and you will see a multitude of pistils or carpels inside the enlarged hepantium. Uh, the fruit, of course, is a hip. The hypantium becomes fleshy, and some roses really nice and fleshy, nice to eat. Uh, and the pistils become achenes. Remember, an achen was a nut, a small nut. It has a dry seed inside, and the external part of the, of the ovary becomes uh, the cover of the pistil forming the achen. Uh, roses have a really large importance in terms of um, uh, the flower trade. They are, they are one of the most, perhaps the most important ornamental plant in terms of the flower trade. Uh, by the way, and we'll see that uh, uh, roses, and when you see roses, they don't have five petals. They have way more than five petals, right? And that is because they have been selected uh, to to, to do that. It's an anomalous mutation. Let me go back. Roses in the wild, if you count them, have one, two, three, four, five petals. Wild roses always have five petals. Cultivated roses, what happens is that there is a mutation. Remember when we saw the ABC gene, uh, or the ABC genes in plural, the system of three genes that controls flower morphology? There is a mutation. Uh, in the ABC system that has been selected by gardeners in which some of the stamens quote unquote forget to be stamens and, and, and yield um, petals. And we'll do a dissection when we do dissections in the, in, the, in the microscope. So really what you call the petals of the rose are technically speaking they're petaloid stamens. They're stamens that through a mutation have been transformed into petals. Uh, here you have uh, the strawberry. The, the flower is very, very similar, but instead of having a, a deep cup-shaped hypantium, it has an elongation of the receptacle coming outside with many free carpels. And the result, you can see here a cut. You can see the hypantium, but the central part of the hypantium elongates into an elongated receptacle. The elongated receptacle hosts a multiplicity of, of um, pistils that eventually, when they become fertilized, they become achenes, and that is what you will see in the, in the ripe uh, strawberry. Really, when you eat in the strawberry, the, the reward for, for the fruit uh, disperser are really the receptacles. The fruits that you can see them here, they are achenes. They're little nutlets, small nutlets that are not tasty at all. Uh, in the subfamily Rosoidae also, the, the genus Rubus that hosts uh, raspberries, blackberries, red berries, moissanberries, uh, they're all within the genus Rubus. Uh, all these uh, plants are very similar to the strawberry in the sense that the, the flower has an outwardly elongated receptacle that hosts many pistils. But in this case, the receptacle doesn't become fleshy, but the pistils themselves become fleshy. So each of the fruits in the pistil is, has a, um, a, a, nut, a nutlet or a druplet, sorry, with, a, with a, the, the internal part of the, of the pistol has become bony, hard, and the external part of the pistol becomes fleshy. So when you eat uh, a raspberry, for example, you're actually eating an aggregation of droplets. Um, roses, apart from their ornamental value, in the Middle East and parts of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, they have a huge importance in murky making perfume. Uh, there is one rose in particular, Rosa Damascena, uh, that is uh, very, very fragrant, and it produces a fragrance known as attar of rose, or rose fragrance, fragrance that can be distilled. But it's a major industry in countries like Turkey, also parts of Greece, uh, Syria, uh, the higher part, the mountainous part of Iraq, and Iran. Okay.
Um, I'll do a little bit more. Let's do one family more, and we'll leave the rest for for the next class. The subfamily Prunoidae, the peach subfamily. If you look at the flowers, they look very very similar to the flower of the rose or of those five petals. You can see them here. A deep hypanthium. But if you look uh, attentively inside, it has only one style and one stigma. It only has one pistil inside each flower. You can see a cut here. You can see the pistil. The pistil has one carpal and only one ovule inside. So if the flower is pollinated, it will develop into a fruit that is a drool. Uh, this family produces a multitude of very, very important uh, uh, fruits. It, uh, it produces, believe it or not, almonds. Uh, what we eat from the almonds is a seed of a drupe that has been selected not for the flesh of the drupe, but for the seed itself. So uh, the coat of the almond is the endocarp, and uh, the almond cultivators get rid, of the get rid of the flesh, but almonds belong in the genus Prunus. So this is one genus with a multitude of species, all of them uh, providing um, interesting fruits and, and very valuable fruits. Then you have the plums, the apricots. Uh, the, there's one type of plums that is used normally to dry and to make prunes. Uh, and it takes prunes, take the name from the Latin name of the genus. Uh, cherries, and nectarines, and peaches, among others, because they do have more, more things. The, the characteristic in the fruit of, uh, of uh, this subfamily, the prunoidae, is always the same. The fruit is a droop. So it has a membrane that forms the exocarp, the external part, the skin of the fruit. Then it has a fleshy mesocarp. And then the endocarp, also known as the pit in, in, uh, in uh, English, uh, is lignified, becomes lignified in order to protect the embryo and the endosperm inside, the seed inside. So when animals disperse, when they eat the fruit, animals eat the fruit, what they disperse is really the seed contained inside the pit, inside the bony endocarp. And uh, we'll stop it here. Uh, on the Wednesday, we are going to see the two subfamilies uh, that we still want, need to see. And we do a little bit of uh, microscope. So I'm going to start stop sharing. Um, this is a recorded video, of course, but uh, during class also on uh, today, on Monday, May the 4th, we're going to discuss the results of the um, uh, midterm exam. I'm really happy. You guys are doing very, very well in, in the middle of a complicated pandemic. So uh, I'm happy and, and uh, really consider me lucky and blessed to be working with a group like you. Thank you very, very much.